ça marche. Ouais. Allô We're just waiting for the presentation to pop up. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, this is the second panel as part of the Parcours L, X Paris Photo. With the support from the Ministry of Culture and Carrying Women in Motion, I don't want to repeat what I said earlier, but I would encourage you all to grab your copy of the booklet we published where you can read the history of the choices, the story behind the choices of the selection. I need to switch to English now for our international guests. However, my colleague, Damaris Amau, or to my left, will speak in French. So if you don't understand, make sure you have the, uh, the right QR code. It's very easy because there's simultaneous translation available. Thank you very much. Use your own headphones. So, um, it worked out. we are here to, um, uh, New to celebrate oh, women celebrate. photo artists. And um, I'm going to briefly introduce the speakers and then I'm going to ask them a couple of questions. And then at the end, if you have a question, please don't be shy. We're here for that. Uh, so Damaris Amao uh, is a historian of photography and a PhD in art history. She co-curated the exhibition uh, Elie Lothar at the Jeux de Pomme in 2017, Photography, Weapon of Class at the Centre Pompidou uh, de Mille, uh, 2018, and Dora Mar in 2019, and co-edited the accompanying catalogues. She recently presented at the Rencontre d'Art uh, the exhibition Charlotte Perriand, Politique du Photomontage, uh, and she just opened at the Centre Pompidou Décadrage Colonial, Anticolonialisme, Surrealisme and Modern Photography. She's currently a curator at the Cabinet uh, de la Photographie uh, du Musée National d'Art Moderne, Centre Pompidou. Uh, bienvenue et merci. Fiona Rogers is the inaugural Parcel Foundation Curator of Women in Photography at the VNA. Technology, please be with us. <laughs> It's such a powerful position that the microphone cannot even contain it. <laughs> she was previously director of photography and operations for Weber, a photographic agency and gallery that you can see here at Paris Photo. Uh, and she worked for Magnum Photos in a variety of roles. In 2011, Fiona created Firecracker, a digital platform and network to champion female photographers. And thank you for being with us. And last but not least, we have Maria Kapayeva, an artist who works between Estonia and the UK. Her work exhibits internationally, including the most recent shows at the Latvian Centre for Contemporary Art and Estonian Museum of Art, KUMU, and the Finnish Museum of Photography. Her works are, the, uh, are at Kiasma Museum and Tartu Art Museum Collection, and her book, Dream is Wonderful Yet Unclear, published by Milda Books, got the Krasna Kraus Foundation Photo Book Award 2021. Together with her practice, Mar Maria works as a project manager at Fast Forward Women in Photography and does a practice-based PhD at the Estonian Academy of Arts. Welcome, Maria. Thank you so much. So, um, the reason why I invited these three uh, incredible women tonight is because they have, uh, through their practice uh, in multiple ways, uh, uh, researched, um, discovered, uh, supported and celebrated uh, the uh, work of uh, amazing uh, women photo artists. And so I would like to ask uh, Damaris uh, if, if you could share with us a few projects that you did. And then I also asked uh, them to select one of the female photographers that is included in the L um, path uh, that was in uh, their respective collections. So one that uh, Damaris chose that is in the Pompidou collection and one that Fiona chose that is in the V&A collection. 
Uh, and because Fast Forward doesn't have a collection, maybe not yet, <laughs> Maria is going to share uh, some amazing projects by Ukrainian uh, female photographers. So without further ado, I will leave it to you, Damaris. Merci. Merci. Merci, Federica, pour l'invitation. Est-ce qu'on m'entend bien? Ça a l'air d'aller. To answer the first question, I am a history, art historian, and my interest in the history of photography is each time l'histoire de la photographie d'une autre manière et d'investir dans um, espace invisibilisé d'une certaine manière. To invest in Donc, invisible spaces in a certain way. Mes premiers uh, travaux uh, uh, et mes premiers projets d'exposition ont d'abord porté... My first projects uh, exhibitions were on men, like Elinota, uh, for example. Pourquoi je me suis intéressée à une figure comme ça C'est parce que... Uh, was interested in figures such as tees, that he, uh, him is that he uh, went uh, against the traditional story on photography. And in a way that was in continuity, he kind of addressed women artists who, not, who were a little invisible in the history of photography and kind of came up naturally. So my two most recent project, on Charles and Perion, I presented at the invitation of Rencontre d'Arl in Arles last summer. And Charlotte Perion, who's known above and all, above, uh, first of all, as an architect, a work in modernism, but she was also a photographer, but much more again. It was very interesting for me to plunge into her approach and her work because her modernity is not just that she was a photographer, she was an amateur, it was a tool for her to understand the motifs and the construction processes, but she also was a very interesting person in the practice of recovering images, the way she archived photographs to make photo montages, political photo montages, that helped her present her own vision of the world. She, if you know the history of traditional photography, you, she's not someone you would immediately identify as a photographer. But for me, in my approach of looking at being interesting into these zones uh, that are hidden, she was a very interesting person because very, you know, between the two wars, she's a woman who used photography, who collected photographs and had her own, it, it, it allowed for her own emancipation and also for other women photographers. In the case of Charlotte Perriot, she had an intellectual uh, liberation in the way she lived, her ideal of living, an intellectual ideal. So the exhibition went to Brussels, presented the Design Museum of Brussels for a few months. It was, it was uh, well, welcomed uh, a lot for this, and very, a lot of interest in this figure who's kind of in between, who revealed what photography was also at that time. What's always important for me is to do exhibitions with my, and also at my team at the Cabinet de la Photographie is to write with Justine. You can look at many women photographers. Exhibitions are great, and they, but they are ephemeral. But we also need to write because students can study them and that their works are accessible, that images are accessible. So most of the work on Charlotte Perrion was to be able to, not legitimize, but bring her into the story, into the history of photography. And recently, Emmanuel Bouchler and I, who, worked on, who also worked on the Charlotte uh, book, Politique Photomage de Montage, we realized there are many titles on female photographers in the photo poche series. And so Geraldine Lay worked recently on renewing the, the, the covers. We also tried to find more names of women photographers like Charlotte Perrion. So it's a really important uh, aspect to reflect upon in this, um, in this initiative. But the poche is also accessible to, to many more people because uh, it's not expensive. They're inexpensive. Expensive books so more people can see her work. Another project 
that I've been doing through my own research on surrealism and photography is the work that I did with my colleague Carolina Lewandowska and my other colleague that was the Getty Amanda Maddox. We worked on Dora Maar. This uh, uh, photographer who worked between the two world wars, close to other artists, mostly known, of being, has, of being Picasso's muse. Our approach as historians of photography was to look at her work as a photographer. He was showing one of her ah, iconic works, one of her, the first one that the uh, Pompidou Center acquired, the simulator, which is an example of her photo montage technique and the resonance of her work with surrealism. We also have at the Pompidou Center a, we've acquired uh, at a sale after her death, we took we acquired 2,000 negatives, a few prints, and some examples of her work as a photographer, as a fashion photographer, an advertising photographer. And her work, the first I've worked with me to take this material, classify it, and make an inventory of it, and then use it to start thinking about uh, um, creating works alors, on, sûr, on, aussi, uh, il faut aussi on who she was. We have to also looking at the, Victoria Convela, uh, for example, continuing uh, in their work. They'd already worked on Dora Mar. They'd done a lot of work at the Pompidou Center. We wanted to do an, an exhibition that wouldn't be just a Dora Mar and Picasso, but really just alone. And her practice, her approach, her career was very unique as well for a woman at that time. And what are the spaces that they went to? Was it fashion advertising? And her political um, documentary photos, notably. The importance of the research that we are doing collectively with, my Carol, with Carolina and Amanda and colleagues from the Tate uh, museum who were welcomed the exhibition so with this exhibition catalog we wanted to also put out to allow a work, to create a work based on her biography not only though when she was and, and who she was uh, in who she was with there's a lot of biography work on her but looking at the career of a, a female artist and uh, as a, her career and, and it also needs to move their biography a little aside and look at their approach as an artist. So it means that I'm not necessarily fascinated with these women that I'm working on, but if they reveal something, they allow us to look at their, at their practices, how they traded in, treated images, because it enriches the history of photography in general, to include them. With regards to the artist that you chose from the, the uh, LX Paris Photo path, First of all, congratulations on your selection. First in contemporary photography. This photographer was born at the end of the 19th century and died in the mid-60s in Paris. It's a quite unique figure in the, mid, in the, the story between the two wars. Her photographs are quite surprising. Laurent Albingu classify her as fairly classic from pictorialism, but she's quite intriguing personality because she was also someone who, who really overturned the iconography iconography of the 30th. I'm presenting her right now in an exhibition called Décadrage Colonial. Your portraits that have almost never been shown of black models that she did in the 1930s. The exhibition we're presenting at the photo gallery now 
He said that talks about the, the way photographers in between the two wars, women and men, how they're produced in this colonial context. It's a little bit the, the elephant in the room in the history of photography of France, it's often summarized by saying that the photographers were sick of photography, photographing um, cities and modernity, so they went to exotism. But no one talks about the colonial context. That's the elephant in the room. So that was a way of coming back on that. And Lord Van Wiel, who was present on that that time, made portraits with black models. You saw one with her child. It was very unique at that time. So we're still doing research now. Those models, who are anonymous, very intriguing, show also the, the way she's looking at them how she tried to uh, reinvent the canons of beauty and the standards of beauty. So she's really a figure of the 19th and 20th centuries in her aesthetic practices because she's come from pictorialism, judged as an actor. Uh, quite academic, but she also used photography to do micro photographs, uh, decorative micro using like microscopic views, which brought out uh, motifs for decorative arts. She did advertising, then we don't use photography enough in advertising. And she even did a published a work to promote photography in advertising. And she also had special roles at that time. She was in charge of creating the first cinematheque. She did women's associations, created them. We often talk about modernism and progress. But this concern she had for sorority. It really came from the 19th century. So in itself, she's really a woman of that 19th, 20th century. In Paris in 1900, there was a big exhibition on Amer by American women photographers. Johnny Johnson brought, she was an American photographer who really promoted women photographers and presented work of 30 by 30 American women photographers, we call the ambassadors of progress. And he's really the heart of the 19th century pictorialism. And she's really someone who wrote for women and, and did what women can do with photography, did exhibitions only with women. So this idea of promoting, and then Laura and Banguillo was born at that time, she's really nourished by that, that beginning, those buds of sorority born in the women's clubs that existed at that time, notably in the US. So Laurent Baglio is, is a figure of modernism, and she continued to receive um, orders, and she's also a figure who promoted a different way of seeing, a different gaze. I find it interesting that she was one of the rare women to propose masculine portraits, male portraits, which was kind of daring for the time. So portraits of men, and there is a, obviously a central uh, gaze. And at that time, uh, the portrait was going, uh, undergoing quite a, quite a, a, a big uh, change. And so her nudes, her male nudes, uh, really offered another uh, gaze, another way of seeing. And the jeu, jeu de paume, uh, had an exhibition of her work, and it's she, from this period through her practice, as a role model, uh, she wanted to, uh, to, to to give new life to to the type of portraiture, and that's why I chose her. So thank you very much.
Um, Interesting choice. Thank and, you so much. Um, uh, we need to put on a Fiona La Rogers presentation. Bomba. Thank you. Um, and I wondered if you could share with us your uh, deep passion for supporting um, women or identifying as such uh, artists and how you set up um, Firecracker and how you became the very first institutional curator that is dedicated to make sure that at the VNA there are also enough women artists in the collection. Thank you. Hi everyone. I'm I'm not going to speak in French. I don't think my don't think my language skills are quite up to it. Um, but thanks, Federica, for inviting me to be on this panel today. Can, do you mind if I? Thank you. That's. I'll see how I go. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Um, yeah, you're right. It is. I told little, you. It's yeah. annoying. <laughs> That's okay. That's very, time. very, very really aggressively aggressive. Yeah. Okay. Or oh, oh, yeah. There we go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. So, starting from the beginning, I guess. Um, so, uh, I, I I went to university, but I didn't really come from a, a, a particularly arty family, um, and so going to university was was quite a big decision for. For myself and my brother, it was um, we were the first generation to go to university in my family. Um, and when I left university, um, I, I, I managed to get uh, my first job out of university was working at Magnum Photos. Um, I started in 2003 as a receptionist and I left 16 years later. Uh, and when I left, I was the COO. Um, so if you just stick around for long enough, uh, you know, eventually. Um, but obviously, while I was there, and I was a you know young woman navigating this obviously very white, very male space, um, and at the same time, I was meeting all of these amazing women um, that I I couldn't work with uh, because of the collective nature of the way that Magnum operates. There was no sort of space to kind of help other people that didn't sort of fit into the, the collective. Um, and I guess out of that frustration came this desire to want to try to help um, some of these women photographers that I was meeting. So in 2011, I created Firecracker. It's a very rudimentary platform. It still sort of is. Um, but it was, a, it was a year after Instagram was founded that that I created this and it was, um, it's interesting to see now there's lots of amazing grassroots platforms that have um, come about to sort of look at um, imbalances in, in the arts, but um, this was, I, this was quite early. Um, and uh, a year later after we, we launched, um, we sort of flipped the community and we, we started to offer a, an annual grant. Um, we've been offering that for, uh, over 10 years, and so we've given out probably about £20,000, I think, to young female or female-identifying artists. Um, this is the sort of list. It's a very nice uh, interdisciplinary, intersectional, super international um, list of amazing women and female-identifying artists. Um, uh, then in 2017, I was invited by Thames & Hudson to write a book about women photographers, um, which I did with a friend and a colleague of mine, um, Max Houghton, who runs the MA Photojournalism um, course at LCC uh, and so works with Maria. Um, and that, I guess, it was really that interest that has... Oh, bon Dieu. I told you it's not. <laughs> Um, so uh, it's that interest, uh, I guess, has led me to this incredible new role. Um, so it was created uh, this year. I, I started in March, so I've, I've been in post now for about eight months. Um, and it's a new curatorial program specifically to support women in photography at the VNA, uh, supported by the Parasol Foundation Trust. Um, it's a fully funded post for 25 years, um, and it looks to uh, analyze and uh, make some contributions to um, the 
sort of gender disparity in the collection and in our photographic programming um, by helping contemporary living artists uh, to sustain their practice, but also highlighting the historic contributions that women um, artists have, have made to the medium and more specifically to, to the museum. This is some incredible um, women in the early stages of the museum's development that were incredibly pivotal um, in, in photography at the museum. Um, so the program spans quite an ambitious um, series of acquisitions, research, publications, events. Uh, we have a very strong um, public program remit and a digital remit. And the aim is to be um, reaching broad audiences and really looking to celebrate women in photography with a really international global community. Um, oops, sorry. And you just opened a show by Laia Abril? It opened today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so yes, we're, we're opening, uh, yeah, we've done a history of misogyny, chapter two on rape, uh, which opens in the Copeland Gallery, which is off site from the museum, but it felt important to, to do that show quite quickly and to also get it into a, 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 a non-museum going audience. Um, so that's the, that's the, yeah, we're very, very proud to be showing that work. Yeah, it's very daring. Proud. Yeah. Bravo. Um, so, obviously, the museum is very well known for its 19th century photographs. Um, you know, we have amazing holdings of Elsa Beng, Lee Miller, uh, Dorothea Lang, um, and it's a, a predominantly Victorian um, collection. We, we started collecting photography in 1852. There's now 800,000 um, photographs in the collection. Uh, there's another 270,000 in the Royal Photographic Society collection, which came to us in 2017. The work on that is, um, is being done on cataloguing, but that's quite critical because there are hidden stories in there that we, we haven't uncovered yet. So we, we don't know exactly what the disparity is in terms of gender and in the collection yet. We've estimated it's about 15%, um, but you know, the work is, is obviously ongoing. Um, what we do know is that uh, women of colour don't really appear in the collection until the 60s, maybe 70s. So this is a, a big area of focus, particularly for, for the Parasol project, um, to try to address some of those imbalances through new acquisitions or having other people come in and sort of interrogate the archive or through commissions. Um, And some of you will know, uh, in 2018, we opened the part of the Photography Centre, reopened with a new, newly refurbished galleries. And in 2023, we'll open, um, the, it, will, it will be completed. So the, the space will double from what you see at the museum now. So we're going to have this incredible new space for photography, including two rooms for contemporary photography. Um, and the Parasol project is, is integrated into the photography section as a, as a whole. Um, so women will have a, a much larger presence at the museum than, than, you know, than we've ever really had. Um, and it's gonna be a thousand square meters for, permanent, for our permanent collection. Um, and the rotations we're working on um, now and, and looking at some really interesting contemporary photography um, as well as the historic um, as well as the historic material which is perhaps um, better known um, and the photography the, the, the completion of the photography center is going to allow us to to do more with living artists um, and living artists like Tara Krasnak who is the first official um, acquisition that we've made under the Parasol project. Um, incredible Peruvian artist, um, born in Lima in 1979, and she now works in Los Angeles. Um, some of you may have seen her work uh, in Arles at the Discovery Awards. Uh, and in she's included in the L selection. <laughs> exactly. So you yeah. can and find you can her see... at the fair. And she's the um, Yes, and she's got her work on display with Thomas Zander Gallery. Um, she won the Discovery in 2021. Um, and 
She's won the Dorothea Lang uh, Paul Taylor Prize and also the Haraban Prize in Tokyo. Um, her previous works, including Master Rituals 1 and Master Rituals 2, um, directly sort of critique the canon of westernized photography, which reimagines, replays, and reclaims it as a woman of color. Um, she's just released a new book with TBW Books, um, which features the series Master Rituals, um, Edward Weston's Nudes, and it's uh, also work that you can see currently on display at the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago as part of their new group exhibition, Refracting Histories. Um, and yes, so Tara is my chosen artist from your wonderful selection, which is almost, it was super tricky to choose just one person to talk about. Um, your understand. selection is beautiful. Amazing work. Um, so I chose Tara because we've, we've just acquired her and she's, she represents the first official acquisition from the Parasol project. Um, and I've loved her work for a long time. Um, this is the first uh, Master Ritual series, which is the Ansel Adams series, uh, which takes his seminal publication, example, Making 40 Photographs, um, where she performs a critique of this, uh, this work, which uses her hair and her body a body of color um, to insert it into this iconic visual history. Um, and with her hair and her hands and her body, she, she creates these uh, interventions uh, within the prints. And there's another series that she, she works where she redacts and takes out the words from his, from his books, um, where she's altering and erasing and obscuring his original narrative to replace it with some hidden hidden histories. Um, it's an incredible interdisciplinary project that she's shown iteratively with poetry and 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 video and um, performance. Uh, this is the Master Rituals uh, series two from um, Edward Weston's Nudes. Uh, this is started in 2020. And it's a continuation of her interests and interrogation of this Western canon of photography um, made in specific relation to her identity as an as a, as a indigenous Latin American woman. Um, it takes on the identities of uh, Western's nude models, Bertha Wardle and Karis Wilson. And in it, she reenacts re their poses, um, but she also restores to the composition the bits that Western left off, um, which were often the women's body parts or their faces this sort of rendering of them being anonymous, um, beautiful, un unidentifiable bodies, um, the subject of a, of a very male gaze. Uh, but in a subversion of that, uh, she's also presenting herself as the author. Um, so she adopts Western's presence as this genius artist uh, and captures herself in a series of self-portraits, which are evident from the appearance of the shutter uh, which you see throughout the throughout the series, um, and I I like it. This sort of questioning this concept of the the muse, uh, the artist genius, the complexity between the relationship of sitter and and subject or or, or artist, um, <coughs> and where Western tends to obliterate um, Waddle and Wilson from his history. Krajnak is very careful to offer really composed and respectful captions um, where she's sort of reclaiming the narrative of these women. And she tends to always include their names in the captions. I've just noticed that I haven't done the same thing <laughs> on this particular slide, but she's very careful to um, reinsert their identity as, as women in this series. Um, question this idea of their, their role within this seminal body of work. And <coughs> I'm starting to visualize a theme that's quite recurring in her work where she's looking at the notion of what gets remembered, who gets remembered and how. Um, and the presence of her indigenous body is, is really critical as well in challenging this, this female ideal, um, a stereotype that's sort of created and propagated by this photographic history that we see um, and shaped by a, a white male gaze. And this is the series that we have just acquired for the um, museum. This will be on display in our new photography center in 2023. This is Contact Negatives 1979. 
which examines the artist's personal history um, alongside the collective trauma of an entire nation, the, the nation of Peru. Um, so she was born, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Nice just barrière. <laughs> Sorry, croaky throat. Um, so she was born in Peru in a particularly bloody year, 1979. Um, great po political turmoil of the time. But it was only a history that she ever read about because um, she was adopted at birth and raised by a North American family. Um, and so she didn't revisit, she didn't go back to Peru until 30 years later. Um, and so over the last 10 years, she's been examining and using performance and photography and other artistic techniques to, to explore this somewhat unresolved identity as an indigenous um, Latin American woman. Um, and these, this series is uh, a series of stage performances, um, stage performances in which she uses newspaper and archival footage from the year of her birth. Um, Scenes which are often quite aggressive, um, scenes which are often uh, feature violence against women, um, and she projects them into onto her body and into her space, um, and she's capturing these self-portraits to literally reinsert her her indigenous body back into her native birthplace. And then, in a temporary dark room, she takes her large format photographs and presents them as delicate um, cyanotypes, and. This sort of speaks to the medium, uh, the, to the immediacy of photography as a medium. Um, but it's also a practical consideration for her. But it's referencing early analog processes and ideas around memory, archives, and legacy, and this continual visualization of how art, how archives can fail, um, how archives can can um, fail to capture nuanced stories, or how some people get left left off of um, of uh, out of memory. And this work makes a really visceral connection between her personal trauma and, and the trauma of her adoption and, and being raised away from her native birthplace. Um, and it's a, a, a metaphor for the brutality of what Peru suffered as a, as a, as a nation. And she says that um, these self-portraits emerge from intersections between the city's fraught history and my own, making visible the ways that violent or traumatic histories can be held in bodies but excluded from archives. That's it. Thank, Thank you, you so much. I hope that other international institutions will copy the VNA and insert a pos curatorial position for women in uh, photo arts uh, like the VNA did. So, thank you so much. Thank you. And I am very uh, honored also to have a, a, one of the most amazing generous artists that I've ever met uh, because instead of like talking about her own practice uh, she's here to share her passion for other colleagues and to talk about the, the project that she uh, manages with Anna Fox um, fast forward women in photography so thank you Maria Thank you. <laughs> Technical problems. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, just uh, briefly to say, actually, I'm artist uh, from Estonia, but I've been living in UK for 14 years. But um, COVID happens, and then I'm back to Estonia. But still, very my heart and my job <laughs> uh, brings me back to UK because I'm a project manager. Um, on, a pro, um, on a project, Fast Forward Women in the Photography, um, which uh, we run with Anna Fox, who is there. She's a director. And our project is based at University for the Creative Arts at FANUM. And we are nearly 10 years doing that, which is exciting. And so for this panel, that's why I decided, Rafa, putting myself on the highlight and my practice, I will talk about some other wonderful women um, I came across recently and we did the projects. And one of the projects I would like to uh, talk about uh, calls uh, putting ourselves in the picture. And it's just recently we, I can say we finalized it, we've done it, which is very exciting. And um, it was um, 
uh, funded by a fellowship of equality, diversity and inclusion engagement fellowship, uh, which by, was given by um, Arts and Humanities Art um, a Research Council, uh, part of um, UK Research and Innovation. And it also, the project was supported by UCA um, University where we based. And um, the, the great part and challenging part for us was that we were working with the five incredible partner organizations in the three UK locations, London, Bradford and Edinburgh. And our partners were um, charity Women for Refugee Women and uh, very well known Autograph in London. Uh, then Impressions Gallery in uh, Bradford and National Galleries of Scotland in Edinburgh. And we also had the fifth partner is Workshop Grow um, Online School, which is uh, led and founded by artist Natasha Caruana. And um, the slides uh, kind of uh, Federica kindly is going to... Um, just showing on the background is, um, is actually spread from uh, our recent book, which I'm going to mention um, slightly later, just a bit describing you what was the project um, about. And the uh, book is one of the uh, final outcomes. So um, uh, each partner organization in each location work with a, a group of refugee and asylum seeking women and non-binary people. And uh, they were totally in the charge uh, how they wanted to kind of build up the program, educational program, and um, to run um, the series work workshops. And obviously, it was a quite challenging uh, for each of them um, because we started our project in the middle of the COVID. And we um, really tried to face the COVID, but at the same time also to create the safe space for each group um, to be able that uh, the women gain more confidence, they learn uh, photographic skills, but what was also was important is we bring up uh, their stories which are uh, quite powerful and, and need to be told uh, for bigger audience. And um, so, uh, and each partner organization work uh, also in, and selected the, some other professionals to work with. And um, I can say, for example, in uh, London, the two main mentors was uh, Bean Devora and uh, Ida Silvestri. In, uh, in uh, Impressions Gallery, we had Anne McNeil and uh, Carolyn um, Mendelssohn. In, in Bradford and in Edinburgh, we had Annie Linden, Wendy McMurda, and Sam Rutherford. And obviously, a lot of some other professionals were involved more like a workshop leaders. And, um, and then from uh, when the, all this uh, workshop series were kind of finished in each location, all participants could join in a two uh, continuous program online with the workshop grow led by Natasha Caruana and they kind of push other skills and or push their projects. And what was also interesting and exciting that um, each organization uh, selected how they wanted to work or either as a group and produce the group projects or kind of try to uh, um, develop um, separate stories and um, individual kind of uh, works to be done by each participant and um, and then uh, when we were like thinking how like sort of what the final outcomes could be we ended up having a three different parts of it and um, uh, one of them is the series of podcasts which which was absolutely uh, an adventure for me and Anna Fox. No one of us done podcasts before, and we both were hosted it, but the podcasts were produced by incredible um, uh, non-profit organization, Social Broadcast. And then uh, we ended up working with the filmmakers, Laura Sims and uh, Sarah Jeans, who produced a short films, more like interviews with some of the participants um, who agreed to be filmed because for actually for some of our participants, being in the public is quite a sensitive subject. Um, a lot of uh, their names, we use their nicknames in the final outcomes. 
um, because uh, some of them still going through the asylum uh, procedures. So, and uh, that was also um, quite a lot of challenges, this project uh, we went through in discussions, uh, which is a quite, um, was a, a learning process for us as well as an organization. And then the final, like we just published, which we're very excited of this book um, as a final also outcome. And uh, it's designed by Sarah Boris and published by Trolley Books. Um, you can grab a copy in a TJ Bouting uh, booth. Um, I know Hannah Watson has a few copies, but if you're interested, you can also from Trolley Books purchase it online. And what we try to do with this book is actually uh, not just showing incredible portfolios women um, created during this period, but we also uh, try to write as honest as possible um, and reflect on the whole process of collaboration, this complex collaboration of so many organizations, also what challenges we experienced in the communication with the COVID, with the facing like protecting identities, working with the different groups of uh, women in different locations. So uh, we treat this book as a sort of a case study, which we hope will be useful for people who are interested in kind of creating collaborative projects and working more kind of uh, with the various uh, marginalized group of people. So we hope it will be something exciting. And also would like to mention this um, with the, especially with the final stage, with the workshop grow, uh, some participants develop this kind of visual recipes, which is a kind of um, a cherry on the top of our book. So if you buy this book, you can also get the recipes which you can cook uh, from different countries, uh, countries of origin of our participants, which is quite exciting. And then I would like to, like when we talk with Federica about picking up one artist, I must admit there's like the 77 artists are quite incredible. And, um, and I'm really pleased that they are highlighted during this Paris photo um, in this year. But I cannot say like um, this year was uh, quite really tight for me personally is and affected by uh, the war which happens now in Ukraine. And in the spring, um, uh, we did the fundraising campaign with the Fast Forward where we help uh, 14 female photographers uh, to raise them from Ukraine to raise the money for different charities in Ukraine. We basically uh, offered them platform, uh, did the prints for them and postage. It was all kind of covered by um, our organization. But through that, um, I met incredible um, Ukrainian artists. And then beyond that 14 artists, I start to look around. And I would like to show you, um, if you go back to Victoria, yeah. So I would like to show you a name, just two, even I would like to mention all of them. And they are not in the LA list yet, but I would like to bring all your attention because I feel the Ukrainian female artists who work now in the Ukraine during the war conditions deserve your attention. And I just very briefly to highlight two, it's one of them is um, Victoria uh, Lihalot, who uh, beginning from the spring, um, uh, continuously doing this diary calls war t war time diary she's kind of documenting um this the moment when the electricity start to be uh, switched in off and a kind of blackout times and she find that uh, she's saying this way of keep taking everyday pictures of this dark uh, city she's from Kharkiv um and um it helps you kind of going through this fear and trauma of uh, uh, fear of uh, ended up to being alone in the city that uh, she start to feel that neighbors are living. And because there is a less and less kind of lights in the windows of the neighbor houses was. So it's kind of in a way her practice, photographic practice help her to deal with the very difficult times and also gives us kind of to look how she sees what is happening there. 
And the second artist uh, I would like to mention is uh, Yelena Subaj and her project Hidden, um, which is actually her book is just being published with this specific project by Besides Press. Um, and I'm waiting and post my copy. I'm very excited about that. And it's a story of um, about the group of volunteers and museum workers who try to save the medieval city of Lviv. Is this is where she's from, from the bombing, by wrapping, saving, storing sculpture, public monuments, artworks. And for me, your images is this kind of like documenting this process. It's a kind of sort of a collage of sacred status, status like human bodies, protective wraps, all kind of mixed up, which in a way for me really talks about the caring for the artworks, but it also caring by people who are in the middle of um, quite extreme situations. So I found it's very um, incredible uh, project. And also she's talking about that it's also for her by documenting what is happening in, in uh, uh, next to her right in the moment, it helps her to feel kind of uh, being useful in this moment, rather than kind of uh, trying not to, uh, knowing what to do as an artist. Because I think a lot of people fell in, the, especially in the beginning, that the art is meaningless suddenly um, in a that extreme situation. And just to finish up, I think it's like logical just to mention like the last uh, slide is uh, we actually, um, with our incredible partners of Belize Photography and Multimedia Museum, uh, Fast Forward was planning to organize a conference which is exactly focusing on the female photographers in the conflict zones. But we postponed it twice. Um, uh, once we postponed because of the COVID, second time we postponed um, a bit the complexities, which is now in uh, Georgia because of the war in Ukraine. But um, we had the uh, meeting with our partners uh, just yesterday, and we still hope it's going to happen. So if you would like to stay updated, just subscribe our newsletters, follow us, and um, we hope it's going to take place. Um, uh, maybe next year we'll see, but thank you. Thank you so much for your fundamental work, Maria. Thank you. I would like to uh, ask uh, the audience if they have any questions. Um, don't be shy. Otherwise, uh, I would like to ask the speakers if they have any question for each other. Or... <laughs> Or, um, yeah, I guess we, sh we can also stop it there. And thank you so much for coming. And I will just remind you the last two events of the day. So at 5 p.m., uh, we have uh, a conversation between Rosalind Fox Solomon and Sarah Meister for, of Aperture as part of the show um, at uh, the Muse Collection curated by Natalie Erschdoffer. And then um, at 6.30 p.m., make sure you don't miss the um, uh, festive, crazy performance, uh, the Une Histoire Manifeste, to really celebrate the five years of this uh, L Path, uh, LX Fari photo, supported by the Ministry of Culture and Caring Women in Motion. Thank you so much. See you back at five. <laughs>